Let's get started with this. Hassan Piker on Kamala Harris's loss. You can't podcast your way out of this. A lot of these guys are right adjacent, maybe. They organically found themselves in this space. And I think the Republican Party took advantage of that very well. That same ecosystem doesn't exist on the left. It's not necessarily flooding the market with like a bunch of liberals. Like, oh, we, if we had like eight more Pod Save Americas that kind of look like me, for example, like more bro -y, right? Then that would be fine. It's like, no, you can't podcast your way out of this problem. There was a list that looked at who had the top like election night coverage, who had the most views. And that list was populated exclusively by right wingers, except for me. So I'm out there. I'm here. But obviously, I'm not directly aligned with the top of the ticket or with uh, many of the establishment Democrats and their attitude towards consistently and stubbornly defending third way neoliberalism. There is a divide here that does not exist within the Republican base of support that will develop a relatively conservative audience. So I think this is an issue that has to be solved top down. I think first, uh, it's not about like 10 more podcasters or 20 more liberal podcasters. I think it's more so about the Democratic Party looking within and doing the correct autopsy after this 2016 style defeat. I think not addressing the economic hardships that people were experiencing with direct policy prescriptions in a way that separated yourself from Joe Biden was probably the number one problem. Democrats have been doing some deep soul searching and plenty of finger pointing in the wake of Vice President Kamala Harris's decisive election loss. Some liberals suggest that the key takeaway from the 2024 election is to build a less version of Joe Rogan. There were several things that contributed to Donald Trump's massive victory among young men, but none were discussed with as much fury and fervor as his appearance on the podcast live streams hosted by Rogan, Theo Vaughn, Aiden Ross, and the Elk Boys. On the left, there's precisively one influencer who commands such large following. Hassan Piker, progressive Twitch streamer with 2.8 million followers, drew 313,413 viewers for his election night live stream. He was the third most popular streamer and also the only non-conservative streamer to break in the top 10 live streams that night. So Piker knows a few things about existing in the so-called bro space. Unfortunately for Harris and the Democrats, you can't podcast your way out of this problem, Piker told Newsweek on Friday. The 33-year-old influencer said it would do the Democratic Party little good to just flood the podcast market with eight other versions of the popular Pod Save America show, a liberal political podcast hosted by a crew of former Obama aides. That's not the problem, said Piker, who would be someone to the left of the Pod Save Boys. People like me exist. I have one of the largest election night coverages out there. The real issue is that the Democrats are up against the ideological divide between its base and the rest of the party. For Piker, the aphorism that Republicans fear their base and Democrats hate their base has never rung more true. Republicans can get away with taking advantage of that space, he said, emphasizing that there are billionaire GOP mega donors who share the same interests as right-leaning influencers, which leads to cross-pollination. But that same ecosystem doesn't exist on the left. It barely exists for Pod Save America. CNN and MSNBC barely even cross-pollinate, Piker continued. The liberal, and I guess progressive, outlets have completely shut off the independent media from entering their sphere of influence. And besides that, there is a deep ideological divide. For months, Piker has warned Harris's campaign that its failure to represent the voters who would cast more ballots for the Democratic nominee would lead to its collapse. He stressed that the Democrats need to move more to the left and stop trying to court moderate Republicans and center right voters who proved again on Tuesday that they would not budge for Harris. Exit polls show that 94% of Republicans still voted for Trump, while independents only broke for Harris by 3%. In 2020, Joe Biden won independence by a whopping 13%. For the Democratic Party has actively chastised and pushed aside a lot of people that would normally vote for them, and they continuously had done this cycle after cycle, Piker said. And in the end, the bottom fell out. It wasn't just a large swath of young men who moved to the right. This year, Trump won one-fifth of black men, nearly half of Latino men, doubling his standing among the first group and moving Hispanic majority counties on average 10 percentage points to the right. In Dearborn, Michigan, the majority Arab community that helped Biden win in 2020, Trump won 42 percent of the vote to Harris's 36 percent. And none of it should have been a surprise, according to Piker. He argued that by sending pro-Israel Democrats like Representative Richard Torres and former President Bill Clinton in Michigan, Harris' campaign openly communicated that they did not want anyone who cared about Palestine to go out and vote for them. They actively pushed aside these people with the hope that they could win the suburbs over, win these conservative voters over, and it was a failure. The biggest mistake that Harris made in Piker's view was not addressing voters' concerns about the economy with direct policy proposals that separated her from Biden. For the entirety of Harris's campaign, poll after poll showed that the economy was a major voting issue for the nation. Exit polls showed that deep discontent with the Biden administration's handling of the economy ultimately drove Americans to Trump. National exit polls revealed that 45% of people said they've gotten worse off under the current administration, making it the highest percent of the electorate to ever say as much, even higher than 42% who agreed with that sentiment in 2008 in the throes of global financial meltdown that was cratering the economy. Piker said if the Democratic Party wants to recapture the attention of the voters they won in 2020, they have to abandon what he calls the vibe session narrative where campaigns chalk up economic anxieties 
of the fact that Americans don't understand the issue and that eventually they'll feel it when their wages catch up to inflation. Most Americans do not care about civility. They do not care about these institutions. They do not have an ideological fear. They just want to stop the hurt, Piker said. If Kamala Harris would have come out and been like, I'm literally going to jail the Walton family, people would have been like, okay, as long as you're promising that that's going to drop the prices of groceries, I don't give it. They're on board with 20 million immigrants being deported because that's what Trump is saying. I'm going to deport 20 million immigrants and it's going to lower everything. It's going to be the solution to the housing crisis, he said. It's an insane thing to say. It's genuinely Hitlerian, but people are like, okay, well, I guess it's going to work. Who knows? We'll see. And they take a shot in the dark. You can't actively act like things are perfectly fine when things have not been fine for Americans for quite some time. Asked about early data that shows more than 90% of counties shifting for Donald Trump, suggesting that Democrats' late pivot towards moderation may not have been the problem. Piker isn't convinced that it's because Americans love Republican policies. He believes that Democratic candidate who can deliver Senator Bernie Sanders' economic populist message earnestly could yield enormous results in a general election. He argues that there are many low and mid propensity voters who don't always show up in the primaries, but could catapult the Democratic Party to major success if activated, much as the GOP has experienced its version on the right. Piker used Missouri as an example. A deep red state, Missouri went to Trump with over 58% of support and re-elected Senator Josh Hawley, a populist Republican, with more than 55% of support. And yet, the state voted in favor of two progressive ballot measures. On Tuesday, Missouri voted not only to create a constitutional right to abortion, but also to raise minimum wage and require paid sick leave. And again, Piker said it was Harris's loyalty to Biden that prevented her from tapping into the politics at play. Liberal polities that are not attached to a Democratic politician are fantastic. They're so popular all around the Rust Belt, all around the Midwest, in the Sun Belt, everywhere. People like progressive politics and progressive policies. They don't like the Democratic Party, and they especially did not like Biden. They rejected Biden tremendously, and they also rejected Kamala Harris partially because she had a very short window of opportunity, and she used that short window of opportunity to rush towards Biden. This is off the... F I'm going to say fair. I broke the needle. Most of this was on video too. I'm, I wonder if they'll like uh, release the full video. You were about to explain why the Ezra thing didn't happen. Yeah. So Ezra Klein and I were supposed to have a conversation about the manosphere, about like right wing podcasts and how they dominate, the, how they flood the market and what kind of like impact this has on public collective consciousness, especially for young men who feel like, you know, they're they're not really associating themselves with any sort of like political movement whatsoever. And the reason why we never actually did it was because even after I did like a whole thing with his uh, producers, gave him information on background, you know, just to like point them in certain directions of research, we never ended up doing the podcast because Kamala Harris became the candidate. So then obviously like everyone focused their attention on that and we kind of dropped the ball on on this but luckily i was still able to have a conversation like this with the pod johns ahead of time so there was at least like somewhere on the record where liberals will hear what i have to say because they're not tuning into my broadcast the moment that they hear me criticize kamala harris they were like oh this guy sucks you know oh this guy's a hater he wants kamala to lose he's a radical blah 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 like or even if they're like i kind of like Hassan, but i really don't agree with him and i personally don't want to hear him on the Democrats because I want to feel good. And I, that's an understandable desire for people to have, right? I get it. I get it. You want a hug box. You want someone to tell you that things are going to be good. The problem is sometimes you need the hard to swallow pills, right? Sometimes you need to hear the hard to swallow pills because that way you won't be left in the dark. Many members of my community, regardless of voting for Kamala Harris, okay, were due to my coverage on the issue, very aware of the the real risks that were at play very aware of the likelihood that donald trump could win the election very aware of the likelihood which i said was going to happen where potentially donald trump could win the popular vote and lose the electoral college which did not happen and and that specifically did not happen because of kamala harris's incredibly bad campaigning in the blue wall where it demonstrably did not resonate the message that she kept pumping, which is another thing, another thing that I kept reiterating over and over again. We are not seeing a dramatic shift in the polls. If you're dumping $30 million into TV ads in key districts and it's not swinging in the polls in your favor, that means the ad spend is being burnt. That means that the message is not resonating. You have the bullets, you have the gun, you have the capacity to fire it, but the bullets are duds, okay? The message, if the message is bad, then it's not resonating. That's it. And you got to re-triangulate. Something is obviously not working. And they burned through $1 billion. Not only did they burn through $1 billion, but they also 
seemingly lost 30 extra million dollars in the process as well. They're 30 million in the tank by the end of the cycle. It is very interesting to see and hear like how different the reality is for many Americans that I guess were seemingly reading very partisan news that presented a false narrative of Kamala Harris absolutely destroying, absolutely running the best possible campaign. And they have consistently, they have consistently tried to play defense for their own coverage. They've consistently tried to play defense for their consultants that did the wrong things. Do you have any different opinions about the polls after this election since it seems 98.9 were wrong? Wait, what? No, the polls were not wrong at all. What? No, the polling was actually very solid. The polling was so solid. If anything, I was wrong for thinking that the pollsters readjustment, the Trump bump, which even the likes of Nate Cohn talked about was not even there. It was just correct. If anything, they still underestimated Donald Trump to a certain degree. But yeah, no, the polls were incredibly correct. It was within the margin of error or completely correct in many instances. The polls were correct. It was more so the assessment of the polls that was incorrect. With the exception of the Seltzer poll that was like dramatically bad, right? Which gave people a lot of hopium in the direction of the Harris party, in the direction of uh, the Democratic party. Most polls were right on the money. So yeah, let's hear. I didn't even know I was in the on the media. People I think loved you on The Apprentice. They were going to love you as a well, president. I figured it would be so easy. You know, it's <laughs> well, very it probably would have been if the media didn't attack you the way they did. If they didn't conflate you with Hitler. I mean, even today, like Kamala was talking about you and Hitler. You're, they're going to take what you said about Robert. We'll e. Lee. never know whether Rogan. You know what's really annoying about this? Comparing Donald Trump to Hitler is not only correct. But it wouldn't even be bad strategy in terms of like communicating to the American public that he is the second coming of Adolf Hitler. The issue, on the other hand, is that you can't say he's Hitler and then simultaneously say, but I want Hitler's party members in my cabinet. You can't say that he's Adolf Hitler and then say, I want to build Adolf Hitler's border wall. OK, you can't say he's Adolf Hitler and then keep saying and Hitler has some good ideas because voters will obviously look at that and go, what the f you're saying he's Hitler, but you want to be Hitler. But why would I vote for you? That is the issue. That inconsistency is something that I regularly pointed out. And I agree that Donald Trump's policy is Hitlerian. OK, and I was deeply frustrated that Kamala Harris and the Biden administration's policy on the border was conciliatory to the Adolf Hitler policies. And not only that, but one other aspect of the the Hitlerian comparisons is that if the out of touch Democrats, right, because that's the way people see the Democrats, they see them as like liberal elites, they're out of touch. They only care about like gay stuff or whatever, right? It's not correct, but that's just the way people see the Democrats because the Democrats don't run on left economic populism, right? If the out of touch liberal elites that are only seemingly caring about gay from in the eyes of the public, which is not correct at all, the Democrats definitely don't care about gay either okay trust me and the only thing you see donald trump on if you also don't really watch a lot of like regular news coverage the only time you ever see donald trump is when he's being a chill ass guy you know talking about doing cocaine with theo vaughn or being a chill ass dude you know flipping fries at mickey d's then you're like is this hitler like I feel like this doesn't make a lot of sense. Okay. That Theo Vaughn appearance broke me, dude. That's when I was like, oh, I was because the Aiden Ross one sucked and it didn't do a lot for him in terms of positive media coverage, in my opinion. But when I saw the Theo Vaughn interview, I was like, oh no, <laughs> you remember like we literally watched it together on stream. And I was like, oh my God, he is so personable in this. He is so human in this. He is so chill in this. This is not good. And it wasn't just Theo Vaughn. I think like, you know, impulsive Theo Vaughn, the, the Andrew Schultz podcast, all these podcasts back to back Nelk boys, all this like it humanized him and made him look like a chill ass dude. Sometimes that seemingly chill ass dude is Adolf Hitler. 
okay? The second coming. This is one of those times. Joe Rogan was the final, was, was, the, was the finishing touch on his, yeah, sure, I got some crazy policies, but I actually have, uh, you know, I actually recognize that the economy is sh and I'm going to solve it by doing mass deportations and concentration camps at the border, you know? All right, let's hear what the on the media had to say about me. His endorsement moved the needle on Tuesday, whether Kamala Harris's appearance would have made any difference. But all the spilled ink about it this week says a lot about where it feels like political influence is headed. I hope that this is the last Democratic nominee who says no to Joe Rogan. Like, even if you have to go to the studio. I, I would go further than that, Ryan. Yeah. You need your own Joe Rogan is the bigger point. That's do, the bigger do. problem. One of the closest analogs to a left-wing Joe Rogan is 33-year-old Hassan Piker, a Twitch streamer and political commentator. He's big and burly, fluent in memes and gaming culture. He gets the internet. But as a socialist, he's likely seen as too radical to be embraced by mainstream Democrats in the way that Republicans have harnessed their right wing influencers. Yeah, the difference is their right wing influencers, some of which are radical, are directly inside of the party. Right. Because the Republican Party is not at odds with like Matt Walsh. Right. They will go on his show regardless of of, of how insane he might be. I mean, Donald Trump went on Alex Jones in 2016 guys never forget that okay i certainly didn't he went on alex jones if there is an opportunity where he will draw turnout if there is a vein he can tap he will tap it okay i watched hassan piker deliver the results on election night with some two hundred thousand concurrent viewers as the news began to set in he started raging against trump supporters who joined his chat to rub in the loss donald trump winning the presidency is not going to improve your life it's actually going to continue making it worse because there are major material issues that you are experiencing and neither party is actually providing any adequate solutions to that but owning the libs is not going to improve your life it is a way for donald trump and the republican party to distract you away as they pick your pockets and rob you blind for years now he's been sounding the alarm on the rise of the manosphere there is a, a massive amount of right-wing radicalization that has been occurring especially in younger male spaces. Here he is speaking on John Favreau's podcast offline. If you're a dude under the age of 30 and you have any hobbies whatsoever, whether it's playing video games, whether it's working out, whether it's, uh, I don't know, listening to like a history podcast or whatever, every single facet of that is just completely dominated by right wing politics. As he watched Dana White shout out the podcast bros during that victory speech we heard at the beginning of this piece, Ross, Theo Vaughn, and Hassan Piker reacted on his live stream. The mighty and powerful Joe Rogan. No! And thank you, America. <laughs> thank you. Have a good night. What is this country? What? We are, we're done. The news we're monoculture done. of old is dead. It seems that to many, the New York Times, a company that employs 2,700 journalists, is just one source of information and perspective. Joe Rogan, another. The incoming administration has shown us that it will lean on a new generation of personalities and media networks to spread its lies and shape hearts and minds. Damn, let's go. That's pretty good. Damn, those hogs really had you worked up, huh? You were really raging hard. Yeah, that was my most quiet rage. And I'm really glad that they showed that and not me just like telling chatters that they're inevitably going to, you know, do the deed. 